Through its remote color facilities, the South Carolina Educational Television Network presents special coverage of the inauguration of Governor John Carl West. The inaugural parade is winding up and a distinguished crowd is gathering in front of the state capitol to see Governor John C. West raise his right hand and take the leadership of our state for the next four years. It's a busy day for the new governor and his wife, Lois. They were up bright and early today to have breakfast with their good friend, outgoing governor, Robert E. McNair. Following that breakfast, there was an inaugural prayer service at the Lutheran Incarnation Church. Following our ceremonies today, there will be another round of busy activities, a public reception in the State House, a luncheon this afternoon, moving in, the official moving in to the governor's mansion at 800 Richland Street. In just a little while, the guests will be moving and taking their place. The governor, in his inaugural address, is expected to have only brief remarks today, and that should please the crowd because we're in near freezing temperatures today. He's expected not to deal with specifics. He'll leave that to his State of the State message next Tuesday to be delivered to a joint meeting of the House and Senate. It's a distinguished crowd on hand. Governor Williams is here from Mississippi, Governor Scott from North Carolina, members of the South Carolina Washington uh, congressional delegation here, of course, family and friends of the new governor. And now let's move to the platform and Master of Ceremonies, Ashby Ward. The processional for the inaugural program of the state of South Carolina. Platform guests are pleased to remain seated throughout the processional. Presenting the honorable members of the State Senate and of the House of Representatives, led by the distinguished President Pro Tempore of the Senate, Senator Edgar A. Brown, and by the distinguished Speaker of the House, Representative Solomon Blott.
Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of South Carolina, led by Chief Justice Joseph Rodney Moss. <laughs> Associate Justice James Woodrow Lewis. Associate Justice Thomas Patrick Bussey. Associate Justice James Moncrief Brailsford. And Associate Justice Cameron Bruce Littlejohn. Ladies and gentlemen, due to an extremely important Democratic caucus in Washington today, some of South Carolina's congressional delegation could not be with us for this occasion. They have, of course, sent their regrets. Representing the second congressional district, Congressman Floyd D. Spence and Mrs. Spence. That is, Congressman Floyd D. Spence. Representing the 6th Congressional District, the wife of the Congressman, Mrs. John L. McMillan. Okay. Uh, we're ready with Senator Hollings. South Carolina's junior United States Senator, the Honorable Ernest F. Hollings. South Carolina's senior United States Senator, the Honorable J. Strom Thurmond, and Mrs. Thurmond. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have with us for this occasion the Chief Executive of the State of Mississippi, the Distinguished Governor John Bell Williams. All right, we're ready with Governor Scott anytime. Next, the Governor of our sister state, the Chief Executive of the State of North Carolina, the Honorable Robert W. Scott. Representing our sister state to the south, the First Lady of the State of Georgia, Mrs. James Carter. And her son, Jack. Representing the great state of Illinois, the Lieutenant Governor, the Honorable Paul Simon. We're honored to have with us today the widow of the late United States Senator and former governor of our state, Mrs. Olin D. Johnston. Governor Tillman and Governor Rockwell on their way over. Over. Stand by. Who's on the way? Governor Tillman is right behind you as is Dr. 
Ladies and gentlemen, a former governor of the state of South Carolina and his wife, Judge and Mrs. George Bell Timmerman, Jr. And former governor of the state of South Carolina, Judge Donald Russell. Presenting now members of this inaugural committee, Dwight A. Holder, Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, with great pleasure, we now recognize the mother of South Carolina's governor-elect, Mrs. Mattie R. West. I think Mrs. West is in her seat. Next, the children of the Lieutenant Governor-elect, the Lieutenant Governor-elect and Mrs. Earl E. Morris, Jr. The children are Linda, Kerry, Liza, and Earl III. <laughs> the children of Governor-elect and Mrs. John Carl West, John Carl West, Jr., Douglas Allen West, and Shelton Ann West. The children of Governor and Mrs. Robert E. McNair, Robert E. McNair, Jr., Robin Lee McNair, Corinne Calhoun McNair, and Claudia Crawford McNair.
Presenting now the wives of officials and officials elect of the state of South Carolina. The wife of the distinguished commissioner of agriculture, Mrs. William L. Harrelson. The wife of the distinguished controller general, Mrs. J. Henry Mills. The wife of the distinguished superintendent of education, Mrs. Cyril B. Busby. The wife of the distinguished state treasurer, Mrs. Grady L. Patterson, Jr. The wife of the distinguished adjutant general elect, Mrs. Robert L. McCready. The wife of the distinguished retiring adjutant general, Mrs. Frank D. Pinckney. The wife of the distinguished attorney general, Mrs. Daniel R. McLeod. The wife of the distinguished secretary of state, Mrs. O. Frank Thornton. The wife of the distinguished governor-elect, Mrs. John Carl West. Ladies and gentlemen, the First Lady of the State of South Carolina, the wife of the distinguished governor, Mrs. Robert E. McNair. Presenting now the state officials elect of the state of South Carolina, Commissioner of Agriculture, the Honorable William L. Harrelson. The Controller General, the Honorable J. Henry Mills. The Superintendent of Education, the Honorable Cyril B. Busby. The State Treasurer, the Honorable Grady L. Patterson, Jr. The Adjutant General and the Adjutant General Elect, the Honorable Frank D. Pinckney and the Honorable Robert L. McCready. The Attorney General, the Honorable Daniel R. McLeod. The Secretary of State, the Honorable O. Frank Thornton.
Ladies and gentlemen, please rise and greet the governor-elect and the governor of the state of South Carolina, the Honorable John C. West and the Honorable Robert E. McNair. Ladies and gentlemen, the presiding officer for this inaugural program, the president pro tempore of the South Carolina Senate, the Honorable Edgar A. Brown. got any stick to work with. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor and privilege to open these inaugural ceremonies. Uh, at the request of several thousand Chile people, I've been requested not to make any long speech cut things short by asking those who are seated to stand while we receive the invocation, which will be pronounced by the Reverend Diamon E. Kennedy of my Methodist United Church here in Columbia. Let us pray. O eternal God, before whom governments rise and pass away, leaders come and go. Make all of us aware of who we have been, who we now are, and most of all, who we have the opportunity of becoming. We acknowledge that we are a people with a history that is neither all good nor all bad, but rather a strange mixture of selfishness and unselfishness, of freedom and slavery, of gentility and callousness. We remember with gratitude leaders who have appealed to the best in us and have attempted to weave into the social fabric of this state the conviction that every human being is of greatest value, that liberty and justice is for all. We rejoice in those leaders who labor to see that economic structures are so ordered that no human life is deprived of its essential welfare 
and who insist that no person shall be denied participation in the decision-making process. And especially are we encouraged when leaders come forth who are willing to be identified with those persons in our midst who are caught in the dehumanizing agonies of life, leaders who give us hope that we shall not be a state divided, half-starved, and half-stuffed. We pray for those who this day assume the responsibilities of state leadership. Give the Chief Executive John Carl West and all others who shall serve with him that wisdom and courage that comes to those who do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with their God. When the demands upon their patience and strength seem too heavy to bear, when we the people appear to be a thankless lot, remind them that their final destiny rests in your hands and not ours. This prayer we pray in the name of him who taught that the greatest is the servant of all. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing and join in singing the national anthem to be led by Miss South Carolina, Miss Claudia Turner, the Winthrop College Chorus, and the University of South Carolina Band, Ralph V. Wall, Director of Bands, the University of South Carolina, conducting. The Honorable Joseph Rodney Moss, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of South Carolina, will administer the oath of office to Lieutenant Governor-elect Earl E. Morris, Jr. I, Earl Elias Morris, Jr., do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, that I am duly qualified according to the Constitution of this state, that I am duly qualified according to the Constitution of this state, to exercise the duties of the office to which I have been elected, to exercise the duties of the office to which I have been elected, and that I will, and that I will, to the best of my ability, to the best of my ability, discharge the duties thereof, discharge the duties thereof, and preserve, and preserve, protect, protect, and defend the Constitution of this state and of the United States. Defend the Constitution of the, of the United States and of this state, so help me God. 
I now declare Earl Elias Morris, Jr., duly elected and qualified as the Lieutenant Governor of South Carolina. Ladies and gentlemen, following the robing, Lieutenant Governor Earl E. Morris, Jr. will administer the oath of office to the state officials elect. I would like to ask the constitutional officers who are to take the oath, as I call their names, to stand in their place, and after all have been introduced, I shall administer the oath Secretary of State, the Honorable O. Frank Thornton. The Attorney General, the Honorable Daniel R. McLeod. The Adjutant General, the Honorable Robert L. McCready. The State Treasurer, the Honorable Grady L. Patterson, Jr. The State Superintendent of Education, the Honorable Cyril B. Busby. The Comptroller General, the Honorable J. Henry Mills. The Commissioner of Agriculture, the Honorable William L. Harrelson. I ask you to hold up your right hands while I administer the oath to you. Do you solemnly swear that you are duly qualified according to the Constitution of this state to exercise the duties of the office to which you have been elected and that you will, to the best of your ability, discharge the duties thereof and preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of this state and of the United States? So help you God. Do you? I declare you duly installed to the office to which the people have elected you. The Winthrop College Chorus, under the direction of Dr. James M. Elson, will perform three selections befitting this august occasion.
Ladies and gentlemen, the reins of government of the state of South Carolina are now to be transferred to the hands of Governor-elect John Carl West. The oath of office will be administered by the Honorable Harry McKinley Lightsey. Governor-elect West will repeat the following oath of office. I, John Carl West. I, John Carl West. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I am duly qualified. That I am duly qualified. According to the Constitution of this state. According to the Constitution of this state. To exercise the duties of the office to which I have been elected. To exercise the duties of the office to which I have been elected. And that I will and that I will, to the best of my ability, to the best of my ability, discharge the duties thereof, discharge the duties thereof, and preserve, and preserve, protect and defend the Constitution of this state and of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of this state and of the United States. So help me God. Having been duly elected, elected and taken the oath of office, I now declare you the governor of South Carolina. <laughs> governor McNair. Governor Morris, distinguished visiting governors and other dignitaries, Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the Joint Assembly, and my fellow South Carolinians. 1970 was the year that the citizens of South Carolina marked the 300th anniversary of the founding of this state. And we now move with confidence and optimism into the fourth century of our stewardship of this land. Our tricentennial year was a time of reawakening to our history and heritage. It was a time of new awareness of the essential character and strength of the people of this state. It was also a time to gain new understanding of our particular moment in history and to view the past and the future with a new degree of sensitivity and perspective. It was a time to realize that no state has produced more greatness in the character of its individual leaders. No state has given more freely of itself in building this nation. But it was also a time to understand that ours is a history of people, of people who have known struggle and survival, disappointment and endurance, frustration and despair. We have emerged as a state in the 20th century still limited in material attainment. But out of the trials and tests of the past, we have built a wealth of human and spiritual resources with which we can now look to our fourth century, a new century of progress for people. As never before, we can look forward with confidence to a new era of achievement, to new milestones of accomplishment for our people, to a reawakened spirit of unity which should project our state to new heights of greatness, unparalleled in this state or in any state at any time in history. I make these statements not in the sense of a politician reaching for the easy superlative on a most memorable day. Instead, I speak with the assurance of one who senses an elevation of the spirit and a renewed confidence of the people themselves. I speak as one who has observed and experienced the resurgence of our state in recent years and has detected the new energy and new determination present within the fiber of our people. In the last decade, South Carolina has made more progress in every meaningful way than at any other time in her history. In fact, I challenge historians of today and tomorrow 
to match the progress that South Carolinians have made in the last 10 years with that made by any state, including our own, in any 100-year period of the past. If there has been a single factor which has influenced this phenomenal growth more than any other, it has been the quality of leadership our state has had in the office of governor. I should like to say especially to our retiring governor, Robert E. McNair, that yours has been a period of unusual service and unprecedented accomplishment. You have served more consecutive years as chief executive than any governor in the history of our state, but your place in the history books will be for reasons other than length of term. Yours will be recorded as a period in which this state experienced its greatest human advancement. By reason of your distinguished service, you will unquestionably be accorded a well-deserved place as one of the greatest governors who has ever served the state of South Carolina. I would be remiss if, it, if I did not mention also the one who has not only been your helpmate, but one whose years as First Lady have brought new dimension to that position and a new and lasting sense of pride for the people of South Carolina. Through such accomplishments as the restoration and furnishing of the governor's mansion, you have won not only national acclaim, but with your charm, grace, and dignity, Mrs. McNair, Josephine, a lasting place has been won for you and your family in the hearts of all South Carolinians. Thanks to the caliber of leadership South Carolina has experienced, the decade of the 60s was one of unparalleled progress for our people. But more importantly, it was a period in which the foundation was laid for the 70s, a foundation giving us the capacity to reach for and attain any goals to which we as a people may aspire. Therefore, it is appropriate on this occasion, marking the beginning of a new century in South Carolina, that we set for ourselves certain goals, goals whose urgency and priority at this moment in our history cannot be questioned. The time has, arri has arrived when South Carolina, for all time, must break loose and break free of the vicious cycle of ignorance, illiteracy, and poverty which has retarded us throughout our history. If to some these goals seem too lofty, impossible of achievement, or unrealistic, I submit that nothing is impossible if we unite together with energy, determination, and dedication toward a common cause. We can and we shall, in the next four years, eliminate hunger and malnutrition and their attendant suffering in this state. We can and we shall, in the next four years, initiate new and innovative programs which will, in our time, provide adequate housing for all of our citizens. We can and we shall this year initiate far-reaching programs to provide more doctors, nurses, and health personnel, as well as better systems for delivery of health care to each citizen. Our, go our goal shall be that each citizen may live with proper protection from disease and proper treatment of illness for his full life expectancy. We, we can and we shall, in the next four years, eliminate from our government any vestige of discrimination because of race, creed, sex, religion, or any other barrier to fairness for all citizens. We pledge to minority groups no special status other than full-fledged responsibility in a government that is totally colorblind.
we can and we shall accelerate programs of industrial and agricultural development until every citizen who is underemployed has the opportunity for full employment. And every young person has a job opportunity that is productive, meaningful, and challenging. We can and we shall strengthen our law enforcement system by providing better training, better pay, and better equipment for our officers, by strengthening our laws and court procedures dealing with criminals, and by working for the removal of the root causes of crime. We can and we shall seek and channel the energy, dedication, and social consciousness of our young people into solving the problems of our time. We do not need and we cannot afford an alienation of the generations, and I pledge that this will be an administration which actively seeks the involvement of the young and old alike. We can and we shall, in the next four years, take whatever action is necessary to assure the preservation of our living, living environment and to provide the type of resource management which will make it possible for all interests in our society to live in harmony with each other. There need not be, and there shall not be, economic or ecological sacrifice in the progress of South Carolina in the next four years. Finally, and perhaps most important of all, we can and we shall provide a better educational opportunity for all citizens of whatever age or status, from a comprehensive preschool program for the very young to a continuing educational program for adults, ranging from basic literacy to sophisticated, advanced, research-oriented graduate programs. These goals, admittedly ambitious, are no more impossible of achievement than those articulated by the brave young president, John F. Kennedy, who stated so eloquently in 1961 that we could perform the seemingly impossible task of placing a man safely on the moon and return within the decade of the 60s, a dream of man for untold centuries. It has been just as much a dream that man one day could conquer the plague of human hunger and privation and could live in peace and dignity with his fellow man. The fact that these conditions have been a part of man's recorded lot since biblical times should make us no less determined to attack them with all of our energy and capabilities in this decade. The setting of these goals is in itself an important first step toward their ultimate accomplishments. And in all candor, the first step is probably the easiest. Certainly, it's the simplest. But if these words can launch our state into positive action, if they can unleash the energies of our people and their government towards solutions, then they will have proved to be a valuable first step. More important than action and good intentions at this point must be the establishment of guiding principles to direct and channel our efforts in this undertaking. Basically, I see three principles to be of immediate and primary importance. First, the goals as stated must be accorded priority status. In today's complex society with constantly increasing demands and expectations of people, there's a tendency to overlook fundamental problems and to scattergun society's thrust on less essential but more glamorous functions. In a state with limited financial resources, we must concentrate with laser beam accuracy on the basic human problems using the constant criterion of progress for people towards stated goals. Second, the achievement of these goals can become a reality only if the people of this state unite and work together, putting aside differences of race, politics, generation, or other. 2,000 years ago, the greatest philosopher and teacher who ever lived said, and if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. The politics of race and divisiveness 
unfortunately have been soundly repudiated in South Carolina. We are all one God's people, and our differences, whether they be age, sex, religion, or race, should be considered as blessings and strengths. As we work toward the elimination of discrimination, as we build toward a better life for us all, as all of the people of our state join together in this most noble of undertakings, perhaps we shall begin to realize the truths as expressed in the words of the hymn. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessing on your head. Third, in directing our efforts toward achievements which have eluded man throughout his time on earth, we must have the active involvement of all citizens. Government is but the instrument of the will of the people, having no power in and of itself, deriving not just its power, but its will and its effectiveness from its citizens. It is, it is not our purpose to change that relationship. It is our goal to strengthen it. What we outline today in terms of human progress are not simply governmental projects. If we are to eliminate hunger, provide better housing, improve the delivery of health care for all, we must have the deep involvement and commitment of the private sector, working in close cooperation with the public se sector, providing the necessary support of our entire free enterprise system. If we are to bring the generations together, if we are to eliminate discrimination, it requires more than a law or a mandate from government. Basic to all our hopes and aspirations is the willingness of our people to accept change and to gain a new respect for the opinions and the rights of all people. Providing a better education for all, especially within our present limited tax sources, requires new and innovative concepts, the most important aspect of which will be voluntary involvement of citizens in the educational program. As we address ourselves to progress for people, it is implicit that I am also talking about progress by people. It is most important that each citizen recognize his responsibility and his opportunity to participate in progress for people and to make the years ahead rewarding and fulfilling. And I pledge to you, each of you, my fellow South Carolinians, on this, the most important day of my life, every ounce of strength, every talent which I possess, to move with you toward these goals for a better life for all South Carolinians and a new and brighter era in the history of our state. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing following the benediction for the recession of a distinguished platform guest. The newly inaugurated governor, lieutenant governor, constitutional officers, and their wives will proceed to the governor's office to greet their many friends. Those who wish to extend greetings may enter through the east door, through the Supreme Court offices, through the lower lobby to the governor's office. The benediction will be delivered by the Reverend Walter Miller Crow, minister, Bethesda Presbyterian Church, Camden. Reverend Crow. Let us pray to God. Our God and Heavenly Father, the state of South Carolina has experienced the blessings of thy providence now since the inception of the original declarations for the independence of all men in the foundation of this nation. That providence has been extended in the intervening years over this commonwealth, and thou hast raised up leaders to lead thy people here. Most recently, Robert McNair, 
and we ask thy presence with him and thy spirit to rest upon him and blessings upon his home as he departs from this high office. And now as we conclude this ceremony, may thy spirit come to thy servant John. Bless him, and be thou with him, and strengthen his mind and heart to the tasks which lie ahead. And bring us together as a commonwealth of people interested in the constructive development of this state. May the grace of our Lord be with you all. Amen. South Carolina has a new governor, John Carl West, and a new lieutenant governor, Earl Morris. As expected, Governor West was brief in his remarks today. It was an excellent speech, his theme, looking ahead to a new century of progress for people. Among other things, he had words of praise for his friend, outgoing Governor Robert McNair. His distinguished service, he said, will unquestionably be accorded a well-deserved place as one of the greatest governors who has ever served the state of South Carolina. Leaving specific programs for his State of the State address next week, the new governor pledged every ounce of strength and all his talents to the following goals. To eliminate hunger and malnutrition, provide adequate housing and health services for all citizens, Eliminate from government any vestige of discrimination because of race, creed, sex, or religion. He promised continued industrial and development, agricultural development, to strengthen law enforcement. Most important of all, he said, we can and shall provide a better educational opportunity for all citizens of whatever age or status. This concludes ETV's color coverage of the formal ceremonies Stay tuned now for special filmed coverage of Governor West and McNair at breakfast, the prayer service at Incarnation Lutheran Church, and a special report on the inaugural ball. Next, on 9.30. This is the South Carolina Educational Television Network. Mm -hmm.